everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of Pro Wrestling Defined. I'm your host, John at Notawire. And please remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up with all future content for interviews with current stars and legends of the business. And follow Pro Wrestling Defined on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Pro Defined on Twitter to keep up with everything Pro Wrestling Defined. And awesome guest on the show today, a former WWF and WCW superstar, former WWF hardcore champion, former WCW tag team champion as part of the perfect event with Chuck Palumbo, former member of the Natural Born Thrillers, the awesome group in WCW with the one and only Sean Stasiak. How are you doing today, my man? Thanks for joining me. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on. We finally connected after all those private message Facebook clips. We're finally <laughs> here. Yeah, it's great. It's it's awesome, and the the studio looks awesome. Like so, it, it was it was uh, it was all worth it in the end. So great to finally uh, hook up with you on this. So uh, uh, for, first things first, uh, talk about the uh, the YouTube channel that you're you're. Uh, Kind of in the process of relaunching now at the moment with uh, with new content and stuff talk about that and what you're up to these days sure hey before i get into that i wanted to go ahead and just give my uh, friends here uh real news yes. yeah real news pr here in dallas texas awesome group i'm really good friends with the owner founder i don't know what you call him, president jeff Crilly. uh anyway great guy great team they've got like i don't know seven eight studios here in these between these two uh, buildings, and then of course they've got another location near where I live in a suburb. But anyway, any entrepreneur uh, that's looking to you know get more you know public relations, media, uh, get their message out there, you know their their business, so to speak, to get a bigger outreach. They're they're great. They've got studios that have podcasts, uh, they have their own episodes. I mean, it's really become it's really grown and picked up some momentum. So as you can see, the studio in here is beautiful. They're all like this. So I just wanted to give a shout out for any entrepreneur that's looking to uh, advance their reach, that need media, promoting, marketing. These, these guys are great. So Real News PR, check them out. Awesome, my man. Sorry, we probably have a delay there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, your question about YouTube. I'm sorry. Uh, my YouTube channel. Yeah, it's Sean Stasiak's World is the name of it. It's, I'm just starting out. I've had a few videos on there for a few years, but I just didn't do anything with it. And so I just, you know, I'm a bit of a YouTuber myself as far as, you know, surfing and watching certain channels. And um, I just thought, you know, why not start putting together some, I love video, I love expression. I love getting my message out there. I'm kind of a diverse guy, I wear different hats, you know? And so I thought, why not create something, you know, just to, um, just to express, to, to be authentic and real and just kind of showcase uh, a plethora of, of all the hats I wear that make up my life. And so just started it out. So check it out when you get a chance. I'd love for you to subscribe, like, comment, share, hit the bell notification, all that stuff. And would love to grow with you guys. So that's that's the channel, more or less. Awesome, my man. Everybody check that out. And I'll include the, the links in the description of, uh, of this and all the the social media post and as well for, for Sean's channel. But, uh, so um, where I wanted to start off before, <clears throat> before we get like uh chronological on mm -hmm. things was um like just recently um it was the 20th anniversary of the the world trade center attacks and um like wwe network did an amazing uh, documentary about the whole process of uh, doing that smackdown uh taping uh, around that time talk about your memories of that uh, of that week um where you were uh, when you found out about the the World Trade Center attack and uh, the, the SmackDown taping, like what was that like? That whole thing must have been so different from anything yeah. you would ever experienced before. Talk about that whole experience. Boy, I started getting goosebumps and kind of almost tearing up in a way just now thinking about that because I saw that on uh, Peacock on on the WWE Network. I don't know if it's still called WWE Network, but it is now on Peacock. I don't. Anyway, that's where you go yeah. to to watch some of the the, the video library and the content. Um, yeah, and I saw uh, that piece, and boy, I was really, uh, it really choked me up. It brought me right back 20 years ago, you know, to that very day. And, you know, when I watched that piece, I was emotional. I, I did, I cried, um, but I also had goosebumps, and I was inspired because I was part of something that was so special and so, such a rarity, you know. Um, and I knew it was big back then when it happened to be part of a, we were the very first, you know, assembly of its kind since not, since that happened so i yeah. just remember the emotion was it was a mixture of emotions i mean you were scared because you were so uncertain and sure what 
God, nothing like this has ever happened, at least in my lifetime. Never experienced anything like, like that, you know? And seeing those two big towers, and that, that's like the symbols of America, you know, the just symbolically. And, and every time I went to New York, I loved, I'd stare. I was always fascinated with big buildings and skyscrapers and, you know, uh, just the fact that the planes had ran into those buildings and they ended up coming down was just like, good. I mean, it was just devastating. I mean, as you know, um, and I remember I, I woke up that morning, uh, we were in Houston cause we had just finished. And just like any of you fans that have watched, I recommend checking that piece out. It's like a 30 minute mini documentary. Like Jonathan was saying, uh, we had just finished raw in San Antonio. And I remember uh, I was driving or traveling with Chuck Palumbo at the time, who was my tag team partner in WCW. We had not been working together in WWE much at that point. I think we were doing different things. I was working with The Rock. I was like the wildy coyote of the WWE at the time, you know, <laughs> kind of the jackass uh, com comical relief of the show at the time. Um, but, uh, but we traveled together and I believe Lillian Garcia was with us too at that time. I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but anyway, we, we got to Houston. We checked in our hotel you know, did the usual room service, went to bed, woke up the next morning. And I remember flipping on the tube and seeing CNN or whatever world headline news was taking place and seeing the first, you know, the aftermath of the first plane going in the building and just, you know, just like everybody else, basically not knowing what was going on. And then we knew when the second plane hit, we knew that it was a, a terrorist attack. And I remember, um, I went downstairs to the workout facility because it's usually what I would do is get up in the morning, have my cup of coffee, go down to the, uh, the fitness center in the hotel, get a little cardio in usually when I was on the road. And I walked in there and, and actually Vince McMahon was in there. And I just, I remember looking at Vince and him sitting on the ground up against the wall with a towel around his neck, soaking wet, full of sweat. He's a maniac, you know, till this, till this very day still. You know, I don't think he's even human, but, um, you know, I just remember looking at Vince and saying, I don't remember word for word, but it was just, uh, can you believe this? Like what, what's going on? You know? And he's like, and I remember him just sitting there and if I could do a Vince McMahon impersonate, he just sat there and just went, those bastards. That's all I remember him saying, those bastards, you know? <laughs> and so, but it was just, um, yeah, it was just, it was really, it was a really uncertain, scary time, you know, for everybody. And then. We were just told to kind of hang out in Houston uh, we because everything was shut down. The airports were shut down. And uh, of course, we were in Houston. I lived in Tampa at the time. And so we just stuck around for a couple of days. And then they just gave us the announcement that, hey, we're going to run a show. You don't have to be on it, but we're going to go ahead. We're going to move on with our lives. We're going to, you know, and, and so there's some mixed emotions about it. Should we have ran a show? You know, it's one of those things where some would disagree and some were, you know what, let's screw that let's go ahead and get people's minds off of the news and this this horror that happened and let's 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 you know let's let's represent our country with freedom and expression and, and and put some smiles on some faces and get people's mind off this for a couple of hours and so you know and i was you know i got goosebumps just now i remember you know and i raised my hand i'm in let's go let's do it and i remember when we were all out there standing at the very beginning of the show uh, we had our little American flag. I still have that somewhere, my American flag that they gave me. It's in storage somewhere. And I remember um, just standing in the building with 15, 20,000 deafening fans chanting USA. It was very patriotic that night. Um, but at the same time, kind of spooked thinking, God, is there something going to, you know, did they got this place secure? Like what? What if yeah. they, what if the word got around that, Hey, they, these Americans got this live broadcast. Let's go hit that next now. You know what I mean? Like there was that uncertainty. So you're kind of like, feel like you're walking on eggshells, you know, but at the same time, you're like, you know what? I'm only here once. This is my life. This is my, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stand for what I believe in. And, and I guess my patriotism, I just felt it. It was awesome. And everybody was like, we all it was like a one big family, you know, it really was. It was just such a great family feel with the, all the talent, the personnel, the, the fans. It was just an amazing experience, man. I was very, very proud that I was part of that I, under unfortunate circumstances. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, like even uh, going back, um, watching it in that documentary, I mean, it, it is, 
it's so different and really like everybody should uh, check that out it really puts you in that place of what the the, the mindset uh, was at the time and everything and yeah it was uh it was incredible to, to uh, go back and watch that again. But uh, so uh, let's get into the the beginnings. Um, obviously, your your uh, son of WWE Hall of Famer uh, Stan Van Stasiak. Uh, talk about. Um, <clears throat> did you always have a passion to to get into wrestling from the time you were young and being in and around the mm-hmm. business, or um, was that something that just kind of uh, developed later on? Like, did you always have a passion for it, or how how uh, um, how did that uh, initially um, come to fruition of you getting into the business? Well, yeah, you know, obviously my, my father's um, influence is going to have a, you know impact on me and, and influenced me to, to want to, I was curious about it when I was real little. I don't think it really um, dawned on me until I, I was actually in high school uh, that I really, this is what I wanted to do or give this a try. And I got started, I got a later start actually in my rest, my pro wrestling career. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. But, uh, you know, I, I had early memories of my father, of course, as a, I mean, as young as probably four or five years old. I remember, you know, uh, my, my mother uh, was with me and my dad, I think he must have been in Madison Square Garden. This is probably when I was like in the mid 70s, right? And I, I I just remember loud crowd, deafening noise, my dad in the ring, bleeding and people, uh, you know, I was petrified. I was terrified that my father was bleeding and everybody was yelling and happy about this because my dad was a heel. Yeah, I didn't know what that meant back then, you know. So that was that was like probably a little too young to be taking me to a wrestling match. But uh, that's why I'm so traumatized. That and, the, and Andre the Giant in my living room drinking beer with my dad till 5 a.m. in the morning. Could you imagine a five-year-old boy hearing a... Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> and then wobbling down the staircase and looking, oh my God, there's a live giant in my living room drinking beer with my father until, you know, 5 a.m. <laughs> so anyway, oh, uh, I, I've got, you know, I, I had a very early introduction to a very wacky, different world. And so mm. I think, uh, you know, of course, I was a big fan of my father. You know, he was larger than life to me. He was, you know, obviously, I think most dads probably should be to their their kids uh, and my dad happened to do something very unique and different um, in way of work. And so I think uh, I was just a fan of him and, you know, I wasn't smartened up until my early teens. So I was very protective and emotionally invested when I would see things happen. And, and a lot of my memories stem from uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, my mom, both my parents passed away, but my mom and her side of the family originated from Portland, Oregon. So a lot of my memories were during the territory days, back when Don Owens was a promoter back in, it was Portland wrestling. And it basically, they ran towns in Oregon and the state of Washington. And so I grew up around guys like, I mean, the early days of Roddy Piper, Playboy Buddy Rose, Dutch Savage, Sandy Barr, who was a referee, but also a wrestler. He had his sons, Jesse and Art Barr. Um, Of course, you know, guys like Rocky Johnson would come into town, right? Every so often, Harley Race, Andre the Giant. And speaking of Rocky Johnson, and God rest his soul, um, he had a big impact on me too. Great physique, just different, you know, quick on his, just his whole style, everything about him was just different than a lot of the guys back then. So I was very drawn to that. Uh, But that's when I met uh, a young Dwayne Johnson. When I was 10 years old, he was eight years old, Dwayne was. And this is 1980. And they used to put us in, a, in the crow's nest, it was called, in Portland, where they did they had the cameras and the commentating table, and the cameras would shoot out to the ring that was out of ways. And um, I'm, I hope I'm not getting off topic here. You asked me one question, I'm giving you 20 oh, responses. All but, good, man, all good. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, um, I remember, uh, so they would, they would have the wrestlers' family members sit in this designated area away from, you know, the general fans and crazy people, right? The fans. Yeah. Um, to keep us somewhat safe, especially if your dad was a bad guy, you know, because back then, man, you know, the cat wasn't completely out of the bag then. It, people really, oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of realism to that, you know. People believed it was, you know, it, it was some real heat at times, and, you know, especially with the heels. And I remember uh, the kids, when the matches were over, all the kids would run in the ring and play in the, the ring like a, a playground, and 
Dwayne and I were in there rolling around and, and, and he headbutted me. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And I got in the car. My dad goes, what's wrong? What's that, that goose egg on your head? I said, oh, that's, that's Dewey, daddy. That's, uh, he gave me a headbutt. We were working on wrestling moves. He, and he was concerned, but I, I thought that was the funniest thing. Of course, later, fast forward in, in years later, I was in the WWE and I was out with Dwayne a couple of times having dinner. And we would tell the story to others like, yeah, I, I, I kind of grew up, you know, across pass with this guy you know I, I used to beat him up in in portland when we were little kids and of course you would tell the opposite story you know that he beat me up so yeah that was uh, a lot of influence on me from my father and just being around especially the portland territory we had moved here to texas dallas uh, a couple different times of course it was a hotbed for professional wrestling the von erics i mean it doesn't get much bigger than that here and they were like gods here the sportatorium yes. just right down the street from here okay right down the highway a few exits um so you know my memories as a young child a young kid growing up i was exposed to that um and so but i still don't think i was like i want to be a pro wrestler until i was in high school and i had you know i wrestled collegiately and i uh, had a very successful amateur career both in high school and college uh, not to toot my own horn but i was a, a three-time provincial champion and i took second and third in the, um, canada for our you know canadian nationals and then you know, I was a two-time runner-up at the Pac-10 Division One NCAA's, ranked top 12 in the country. I'm really putting myself over here, aren't I? But my point is, <laughs> you might my, as well. <laughs> my point is, my point is, is that um, I was really focused on amateur wrestling, you know. And I was watching, and I, of all things, I was sitting there um, watching a wrestling show, WWE, because I was living in Oakville, which is a suburb outside of Toronto at the time. I was living there. And I was probably like 17, 18 years old, and I was on the phone with a good buddy of mine, and we're I said, hey, you got wrestling on? And we're watching wrestling, and I'm on the phone with him, and it was a Mr. Perfect match. And I remember looking at him, watching him, and I was already a fan. And I had met Kurt when I was in Portland. When I was a little kid, he was just coming up through the ranks, and Portland was a, a territory that a lot of these guys that became huge names went through to make a living, but to, to, to hone their craft, to get, you know, with, with airtime, TV time, interviews, promos, like the whole, just to perfect the craft. So these territories were mm. great for that, right? To really yeah. learn the craft. So I had met Kurt, but I hadn't seen him in years, but I saw him as Mr. Perfect later when he showed up on WWE, back then WWF. And I remember talking to my buddy and I said, Matt, I said, his name is Matt. So I'm giving a shout out to you, Matt. You need, you need better phone etiquette, Matt. I left you some WhatsApp clips. You better get back to me. Anyway, um, I'm on the phone with Matt, and I said, "Matt, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a pro wrestler." Like, duh, no kidding, Sean. I mean, we always knew that, but I didn't really think that much. I was more of a baseball fan. Loved hockey. I, you know what I mean. I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. I looked at it as more of a fan and a fan of my father. But then. You know, then, but in high school, you know, I'm working out at the gym with my buddies. Um, we're watching wrestling every week. I started getting inspired by some of these larger than life characters, like, you know, Ultimate Warrior with the physique and the face paint. Um, you know, Sting, of course, later, the Road Warriors. I love the theatrics and Rick Rude and even, you know, Piper and all these, all these names, all these, you know, Hogan even, all, just inspired by these guys. And, but it was a Mr. Perfect match that I, I, I saw those white boots, that singlet, you know, the long uh, flowing blonde hair, you know, spitting the gum out, the towel thing, that whole gimmick with Bobby Heenan. And I said, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And I thought it was so bizarre and ironic that fast forward years later in WCW, I would face off against one of my child or really teenage idols, man. It was so awesome. I was yeah. so honored to work with Kurt Hennig. And even though it was towards the tail end of his career, it's still Mr. Perfect, man. It's still Kurt Hennig. Um, and the, the thing, and I don't mind, and I'll share this last part with, with the Kurt Hennig about, you know, getting into the business and all that, what inspired me. He was one of them for sure. Um, I felt so uncomfortable, though, when they had me go over on him and to also beat him in his own perfect plex. I felt so uncomfortable with that. I told Kurt, I said, I don't. Is there any way we can do something different where I could, you know, I could, if I'm going to go over, can I put my foot on the rope? Can I pull you? Can we do some chicken shit type, you know, heel move? But to, I felt so uncut because I had so much respect mm. for Kurt Hennig and God rest his soul too. So 
that's the moral of kind of what the buildup was for me to, to get into professional wrestling, what inspired me. That's a cool statement, though, the fact that uh, he went through with that. That, that. that says a lot of how much he must have thought of you, uh, Kurt Henning, mm. the fact that, um, that he put you over uh, at, at that point and, and, uh, and with his move as well. So like, that says a lot of uh, how highly he thought of you at the time. Yeah, it, it, <clears throat> it did uh, speak volumes. And I, I know that he loved my dad. He really looked up to my father because my father and his father, Larry the Axe Hennig, worked together mm. and they were great friends. So it, I think it was just that uh, commonality of second generation and our fathers worked together. And, I, and my dad knew Kurt when he was a little kid, you know, so there was a, that relationship there, too. So I think it's kind of like, hey, you know, he's kind of like part of the, maybe a distant family, I guess. Who knows? Sure. And uh, so we'll get into your uh, the, the first WWF run uh, with, with the, uh, the meat gimmick. Uh, talk about who came up with it, who came up with that storyline. Was that a Vince Russo idea, the, the, the gimmick and the storyline with Terry, Terry Runnels and uh, Ryan Shamrock? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I think it was either Vince Russo or uh, Ed Ferrara, I think, actually, who was also a, a writer for WWE at the time, if you remember yeah. that name. Yeah, and I think I heard this. Well, I heard the story, and I think this might have been where it stemmed from. But I guess there was some movie um, that Ed Ferrara and his father loved. I don't know what it was. There was a character in the movie named Meat, and it was a. And I guess they his dad's nickname was Meat on a softball team. I don't know. They had this thing with that, the name Meat, <laughs> and they thought that, <laughs> and they and somehow they. they they were coming up with one word gimmick names at the time, you know, with the attitude era. And so, mm. yeah, I'll be honest with you. When I first um, was pitched that, I wasn't overly pleased. Um, I had anticipated my uh, a majority of my, uh, or at least a big part of my life, anticipating becoming a pro wrestler and taking after my father and carrying the Stasiak legacy name uh, and all that, all that, hard training and work and working out in the gym and the amateur wrestling and you know practicing my craft in front of cameras and um you know just anticipation to to train to be here finally and here's your gimmick name it's meat uh you know i i, I explain this to people as you know it's kind of like uh, an actor you gotta look at it like that at least i did at the time you know what it's a role Go ahead and pick it up, play it, play it the best to your knowledge. It's not going to be your only role that you'll play, your only character you'll portray, like in a film, for instance, or a TV show. Just play the character the best you can. Get your start, get your feet wet. It, you know, and I had some veterans. They understood that I was a little disappointed with the whole idea because I really wanted to be – what I perceived my professional wrestling career and what I anticipated – was going to be much more. I mean, I know it's entertainment. It's good to make people laugh and put smiles on faces, but I wanted to be taken more seriously. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to be the very first father-son duo to ever win the WWE Championship. And by the way, that's never been done to this very day. That's still a piece of history that's still out there. Um, wow. But, um, yeah, I just took it and, played, and ran with it, and it didn't last, what, eight, nine months, and then it was over anyway. So there you go. And we'll get into a few more bits about uh, about the, the meat character uh, during the, the fan questions later on. But uh, we get into the uh, to the WCW run. Uh, is is that why you ended up going to WCW? Was it just kind of disappointment over the meat character, or uh, how did the WCW deal come about? Well, Jonathan, this story has followed me around my entire career, and for a while there, it used to bother me. But I just finally embraced it and realized that my name and my career and my transition from my first reign in WWE into WCW was because of an incident that took place called the tape recorder incident. And I'm sure you might have heard of this, but I'll go ahead and share a quick Reader's Digest of the story. It's basically a rib gone bad. It's You've heard the term, and not to sound cliche, you know, wrong place, wrong time. That's exactly what it was. I wasn't working for hard copy. I wasn't working for another wrestling company. You know. Mike Enos, one of the Beverly Brothers, told me years ago, he said, professional wrestlers are like junior high school students with money, you know? Um, there's a lot, of, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of juvenile stuff that can take place in, in that business. And it's all part of the, the culture, I guess, right? But, um, 
you know, a lot of par a lot of paranoia in that business. Shit, I was paranoid, you know, when I first came in. I just, you know, I don't think I dealt with my father's death, to be quite honest with you. It was very shortly after he had passed away that I had my opportunity to go into WWE, and I think I put too much pressure on myself and was way too hard on myself, became almost neurotic and drove people nuts. I mean, you know, just with wanting to be almost a perfectionist, wanting to not screw up so bad that guess what? If you try too hard not to screw up, guess what happens? You screw up, right? So hmm. I tell people now, I say, have fun, man. Be respectful, pay your dues, but have fun. Go Because it doesn't last very long, you know? Life is short, especially a, a wrestling career, you know, with any professional athletes too. Just have fun and enjoy it. Let it rip. And chances are you'll do better. You'll perform even better, you know? But um, yeah, I, I, it was a, a rip gone bad. Played a joke on a couple guys, a couple wrestlers that um, actually just backfired on me and made me look real bad at the time. And looking back at that, I think, well, if I now being a, a veteran type or being around the business for so long, if some rookie came in and had a tape recorder and was recording a couple conversations as a joke to play it back for them later, you know, to say, hey, this is what you guys sounded yeah. like in the car. That's all it was intended for. But and that person lied and said, oh, no, 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 and, and put the tape recorder away, and then you go and hear your voice, your conversation, it makes that person look really bad. And, and I could see why there would be a trust issue. And that's what happened, man. It was just a really unfortunate thing that um, no wrongful intent whatsoever. I think most people that know me, that know the story, and, and by the way, that's an amazing story. It's funny how a story gets out and it gets so... Uh, fabricated and so exaggerated. Mm. I've heard like 20 different versions of the tape recorder incident that I was so paranoid, right, Jonathan? I was so paranoid that I was uh, had a tape recorder to just see who was talking about me, who was talking behind my back. <laughs> you know, let me get a tape recorder. Come on, man. I had the tape yeah. recorder. My dad got me my first tape recorder. And I was, you know, here you go, Sean, here, player, you know, I used to do impersonations, imitations as a little kid. I love documenting things, like I said, with the YouTube channel. Love, I was the guy in high school that always had the video camera. I was always, you know, recording things. And, and also, too, and I'll give this advice to any young talent out there that's trying to develop their craft. And it was told, Do Tom Pritchard, Dory Funk Jr., who trained me, said, hey, you're on the road for many hours. You're, you're spending a lot of time on the road. Perfect your craft, get a tape recorder cut promos, work on your interviews, l listen to it back, you know, critique it. That's why I had it in the first place. If I was working for a hard copy or if I was uh, trying to pull something on somebody in a, in a malicious way, why the heck would I take leave my tape recorder in a gym bag with a bunch of wrestlers and, you know what I mean? Come on, man, I would have I yeah. like sealed it up and FedExed it back home or to whoever I was working with, right? so-called whoever yeah. I was working with. So, yeah. But, you know, it got me fired, man. And it, it caused me a lot of grief. That, that was a really, um, that was a really, really tough time. One of the hardest times of my life because I anticipated um, a lot of my life to, to have this opportunity and then to get fired and to lose my dream job because of something so, honest to God, was so innocent but it looked so bad at the time. Again, wrong place, wrong time, just the way it looked. Um, boy, that was it, man. And, and so I was concerned because I, you know, the only other viable company at the time was WCW. And, you know, now I think Vince Russo had been, was already over there with Ed Ferrara and those guys, uh, we had a good relationship, I thought, or at least a decent relationship. But I, I was concerned because, you know, it's a small world, you know, and people talk and the boys talk and, and, mm. and the word got out that, you know, Stasiak's recording people. We can't trust them, you know. You know what I mean? And I was like, would I get an opportunity yeah. to go over to the other company and um, be part of that? And so I think with Russo and I, I think he must have had a word with Paul Orndorff. I keep saying, God rest their soul. There's so many guys we've lost, so many brothers, yeah. you know. God, and he this was, year alone even has been bad. Pardon? Oh, this year alone. And this yeah. year alone, yeah. even we've yeah. lost so many. I know. And Paul was a huge Mr. Wonderful. You, he's one of those guys that inspired me, man. I was so just great physique, intense, real athlete, just uh, believable. I love Paul Orndorff. I was a huge fan. And um, and I hadn't seen Paul in a while. But, you know, when you, le you learn that he, he had passed, it's still like, well, that's part of my upbringing that's part of my childhood that's part of my culture that i'll never be able to see him again i'll never be able to see him at an autograph signing or an appearance he it, that's fine I mean, he's 
you know, he's in a better place. But um, I think he, uh, Russo had a word with Paul because Paul ran the power plant with Sarge at the time. Uh, and hmm. so they said, hey, you know, probably give Sean a, give him a shot, probably test me out. So that's when I went to WCW for a tryout at the WCW power plant. This is in 2000. Yeah, right after the, yeah, 2000. And um, I hung out there for a week. And that's where I ran into and met the likes of uh, what he would mention earlier, the Natural Born Thriller members that would become later, you know, Natural Born Thrillers. Chuck Palumbo, Sean O'Hare, Mark Jindrak, Mike Sanders, uh, Reno, um, Johnny the Bull, and, and Kiwi, you know, and all these guys, man. I was, you know, I knew I had the goods. I had, uh, you know, enough to, I was still green. I was still very new in the business at the time. But I was concerned, were they going to accept me? Because that was the bigger question. How am I going to be perceived? How am I going to be, am I going to be rejected because of what, you know, but I, they, we had some time to spend together. We went out to lunch, we work out together. And I think they heard the story. They, they believe my story, which is the truth. And I think they just said, that's just sucks. That's too bad, man. And, and I think they just accepted me. They kind of accepted me into their group and um, had my, went down there a couple times and uh, finally got got the phone call from Paul or Kevin Sullivan or someone and just said, Hey, welcome, welcome to the team. Welcome, welcome to your new home, you know? And, um, I even told Paul, I remember sitting there with Paul and Kevin Sullivan. I said, I said, guys, I want to be the next Mr. Wonderful in honor of you, Paul. You know, I know there can never be another Paul or there can never be another, any of anybody, but I, hmm. it was out of, just respect and honor of Paul Orndorff and just, you know, being so influenced by, by him. Um, I wanted to, to, you know, I wanted to have that opportunity to be able to showcase and have that style and that, that, that effect on people. So yeah, that's how my WCW, um, career started really the, the embryonic stages of how that all developed the transition from the tape recorder incident, getting fired into getting, you know, tryouts with WCW. And then finally, getting called up to the main roster for WCW. And then they put me with, uh, had that feud with uh, Mr. Perfect. Um, and then they put Chuck and I together to work with uh, Brian Clark and Brian Adams, Chronic. And yes. uh, that was fun. I had a lot of fun. And, you know, Brian Clark and I have reconnected recently. And uh, he's a great guy, man. It's funny. Um, I, it's like a brotherhood, you know. We pretty much talk every day. We're clipping each other back and forth. And he's working out. Tw I got him doing two-a-days and... You know, um, yeah. he's still he's still at it, man. And, you know, and um, he's a very creative guy. You know, I, I learned a lot about him. I didn't know back then. I just worked with him, you know, a few times and always got along backstage. I think that if, you know, if if we could go back in time or we were in the same situation, I definitely would be traveling, you know, with, with Brian Clark and uh, Brian Adams is still here with us. God rest his soul. You know, Brian was a great guy too. I didn't know him real well, but he was always very kind, very nice to me. Um, and um, I, I liked working with those guys. We we had a lot of fun. Yeah, you had an awesome run together. I absolutely love, um, <clears throat> I love the team name that you and Chuck had, the perfect events. I, yeah. I just thought that was awesome. And uh, like, and the, and the natural born thrillers, but uh, your matches with Chronic were, were awesome. I mean, like people should go back and watch uh, Bash at the Beach 2000. Yourself and Chuck against uh, Brian Adams and Brian Clark Chronic. Absolutely awesome match. Yeah, one of my favorite tag team matches from uh, from WCW. That's where uh, uh, where Chronic won the the tag titles back uh, from me. It was absolutely awesome. But uh, talk about um, what Chuck was like to, to team with, and then. Uh, the, the transition into the um, natural born thrillers group because uh, they, they were like you were one of the the uh, the hottest acts in in WCW in 2000. It was something really new and fresh, like and kind of cutting edge to it. Like that, I, I I was watching. I started watching WCW in kind of summer of '99, but missed say December to like April or May. So, like, I was really into it just as all of that was kind of beginning the whole New Blood storyline, right. you and Chuck, and then the Natural Born Thriller. So, talk about the, the Natural Born Thrillers and, and teaming with Chuck and winning the, the tag titles together. Well, teaming with Chuck was, I loved it. It was great, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was so happy at that time because I, what I had just gone through with that whole WWE, such a letdown, such a, such a nightmare, man. Like, look, 
I've lost my mom. I've lost my father. I've gone through, we've all gone through tough times and grievances, right? But that, that situation with that, that incident that took place and, and knowing that it was so, uh, uh, there was no wrongful intent. It's like being accused mm -hmm. and, and, and being punished for something that you, if they only knew your heart, if they could hook your brain or your heart up to a monitor to say, okay, let's see the truth with this person. They would know, okay, we got nothing to worry about, man. This guy just screwed up, stupid, dumb mistake. You know what I mean? But that was one of the biggest things. I mean, probably top 10 things in my life that are the biggest grievances that I've had to go through. That's one of them, man. That was, that caused me a lot of despair. That was a tough, tough, um, period for me. And, um, I was just so happy and so grateful that uh, WCW gave me an opportunity and I was welcomed into that group, you know, and in the locker room too. I got to tell you a little side quick story though and, and remind oh, me to get yeah, back sure. on track. I got it because I'll forget it. So Brian Nobbs, we're in the locker room, right? <laughs> we're in the locker room and um, Sid Vicious is there and, you know, I, I don't know who, I, I'm trying to think, Sid was there, Brian Nobbs, uh, of course, I mean, I think, I think Chuck was with me. Some other wrestlers were getting, you know, laced up for the for the show, and I just remember <laughs> Brian uh, Nobbs goes, "Hey, Stasiak," because he's very loud. You can't miss Brian Nobbs. Yeah. Stasiak, why don't you take that tape recorder and stick it right here? He bends over, <laughs> butt naked, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> I and I think they were just testing me to see how I would take it. You know, like was I going to get pissed off? Was I? I couldn't stop laughing, man. It was it was so funny, man. It was like it was just his way of saying, ah, "Don't worry about that. We accept you here. We trust you, man. Just you know, keep your nose clean and walk the straight and narrow. We're good." You know, I had yeah. to share that story. But anyway, um, that's awesome. That's but funny. I was just so ha I was so happy and so grateful that I had the opportunity. And honestly, when I look back at my WCW career overall, and I'll get into those specifics in here in a second, but I was so. Um, uh, I felt so blessed because I ended up getting more TV time. I ended up becoming a three-time world tag team champion for WCW. Traveled the world. Had so much fun with Kevin Nash and, and the, the thrillers. And just, I wish I would have endured it more. I was, out of the whole group, I was kind of a, a little bit in the beginning, a little bit of an outcast. And I'll, I'll get into that in a second. You asked me how I accepted that. At first, I didn't care for it. I didn't, I wanted to be a singles competitor. I didn't want to be put in a fact. A faction. I wanted to break out and develop myself as a solo, you know, singles wrestler. But um, yeah, you know, I, I WCW and and look, I all I ever wanted to work for was WWE. I grew up, I lived outside of Toronto for years, and that's you know that's on the East Coast, you know, Eastern Seaboard. That's all you know. We call it New York, Vince's territory, right? And that's, yeah. that's all I ever wanted to work. I never wanted to work for WCW. I, I, if you, I've never worked for any other promotion except for WWE and WCW. I've had you know some independent matches, and I never went to TNA. I've been backstage at AEW a couple of times, which maybe we'll get into here in a second because I'm. It's pretty exciting what's happening with the wrestling world now. You know, with with that company, oh, I'm very man, happy yeah. for them. Man. I think that's awesome. But uh, with, it was, oh, definitely. with Punk coming back, oh man, I was goosebumps, man, so, seeing his. I'm, I'm skipping around here, so let me let me get back to what I. But so WCW was just an awesome experience for me. Um, very blessed, so grateful that I had the experience. Wish I would have enjoyed it even more because I was a little bit of a pain in the ass at the time. I, you know, and I think I think there's a little bit of uh, in the beginning, maybe a little bit of tension or dissension amongst myself and maybe a couple of the members because I think they felt people can feel energy. And they could feel without even saying that. I just didn't want to be, I just want to be part of the group. Um, and in fact, I think one of the angles that we ran is when they were outcasting me, Kevin Nash and the Thrillers, by kind of kicking me out of the group and then feeding me to Goldberg, you know, was one of the storyline angles there for one of the shows. And I think that wasn't yeah. too far at the time from how I really felt. And I think that they really felt that. But then I came around and ended up getting to know them better. And I just kind of accepted it. And I was just, you know, I just kind of um, just develop and, and groom myself into it. And I, you know, so that was, I look back now, it was, a, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed working with those guys. And talk about great athletes for guys that size. I was the least athletic of all these guys uh, as far as like maybe in the gymnastics uh aspect of things i mean sean o'hare 6'6 280 doing backflips and spin kicks i mean 
you know, and I, I'll watch some of these older, um, this older footage and I, and I, and I see, I didn't, I think I was so focused on, it's a very self-centered, selfish business. You got to focus on yourself, your brand, your character. I mean, you're just immersed in what can I do to elevate myself to that next level, right? And Absolutely. I go back and look at this footage and go, oh my God, Sean O'Hara was, he had a great look. Just, look, I mean, not just the, you know, he had an athletic functional body, not like nothing against bodybuilders, but like just the flips and, and the things that he could do, his athleticism was incredible. Same with uh, Palumbo, smooth, um, just athletic transitions, Jindrak, great athlete, you know? I'm the only one that didn't do all those crazy flips and stuff, but I think I had a little bit more experience at the time because I had that year and a half, two years of WWE with the developmental and, and then being in the, on the main roster. So I think I had a little bit more of a, maybe a ring savvy where I didn't have to do as much and I could still get maybe even more of a reaction to piss people off as a heel, you know? So yeah. isn't that the whole idea? Rely of more on psychology. Right, man. Like, isn't that the whole idea? Try to do less is more and try to get more of a reaction, you know, as so you get more Absolutely. mileage out of your career. So, but, um, uh, and then, you know, being tag team champs with Chuck was just awesome. Uh, we, we won the belts from Chronic in a very cheesy way uh, from a disqualification. I didn't know you could win a belt on a disqualification. That was always the rule that you couldn't win the belt, but we won them somehow. Mm. And you know, the irony of that is that match took place in outside of Boise, Idaho, of all places. And that's where um, I went to school. I went to Boise State, right? And that's also where I developed, um, I mean, I get into this a little bit more, but it's an alter ego, theatrical expression of Dr. Sean. Um, I'm a chiropractor, by the way, in case those who don't know, I've been a chiropractor for the past 15 years here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, Dr. Sean's alter ego is a character named Phobia, and that's spelled F-O-B-I-A. And you can check out the outdated website at FOBIATV.com, which is soon to be upgraded soon. So stay tuned for that. These are some cheap plugs, Jonathan. I'm sorry, man. It's all good, man. It's looking but I, 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 I'm a big kid. I love Halloween, right? Big kid, love Halloween. Um, I got tired of being one year I'm the ultimate warrior. The next year I'm Rick Rude, a chubby Rick Rude at the time. And I said, you know, I'm tired of being these other wrestling characters for Halloween. So I'm gonna do, what can I do? I'll do my own thing, right? Next year kind of thing. So it's the springtime. I have school exams. I'm in the dormitory in the dorm room, right? There's no air conditioning, but I had a fan on and I had my windows down to get, you know, some cool breeze at night. I noticed Jonathan for a couple of weeks, I get, I get these, I was feeling nauseous and I had these bumps on my face. And at night I'd feel these little, like, like I don't know, like something was like, Run, like little, I don't know, like debris or something. I, you know, I'm sleeping and this went on for two weeks. And I'm thinking, okay, I got stress bumps from being, you know, stressed out from exams. I feel kind of nauseous because I'm just not taking care of myself, I guess. I went to the nurse's uh, or the, the, the little clinic for students, right? She does a little cotton swab thing, comes back, says, um, Sean, those aren't uh, stress bumps, those are spider bites. And are you okay? Oh, Jesus. You don't have, you don't I, have I, a spider bite, I, I accidentally you? poked myself in the eye. Oh, geez. Look at that. <laughs> look at the effect I have on people. We're, we're, we're across the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean. Look at the power phobia brings. I don't have to. I can just talk oh. to you and I can start causing damage. Anyway, <laughs> lo and behold, I go back to my door. You okay there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're all good. All good. I go back to my dormitory room, right? There's a spider nest underneath my bed. So that... The, I had a spider nest under my bed the whole time. Um, I couldn't go back to that room. I could. I couldn't. I had to spend the next uh, week and a half of the friend's house. I said I got to finish. My, I can't. I can't go back. And I was so freaked out. Even the exterminator did this. I can't go back in there. So later that Halloween, I um, decided to. You know, what could I cover my face with? Um, and I thought, you know, a spider. And I had this fear of spiders. And I had all the. You know. And so I, I did the did the spider gimmick, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I muttered one word in, under my voice, and I just said, "Fear, fear, phobia, phobia. I have, I have a phobia. Arachnophobia is fear of spiders, but I just that one word, phobia, came across my, you know, I just said it out loud, and then because I had a great rapport with the local news station in Boise, Idaho, Channel Seven News, I um, used that character to cut. Uh, 
PSAs to the kids, like safe trick or treating, don't talk to strangers, check your candy, blah, blah, blah. And I used that footage to send to WWE to get my actual tryout with WWE. So the phobia character is essentially what got me my tryout with, with WWE, right? And um, wow. so we never used the character ever. And, you know, there was a couple times I thought maybe we would. Uh, when Hogan was with TNA, we, we spoke for a little bit and um, he wanted to possibly bring that in. He liked the character, thought I Sting, Steve Borden needs a nemesis. I'm like, great, there's another teenage idol of mine, a huge, ins I mean, Phobia has, is kind of a younger stinger, surfer sting, kind of, there's some similarities there, you know, I don't know if you've seen some yeah, of my yeah, images. Sure. And, um, but it never came to fruition and I was very disappointed and everything, but now looking back, Jonathan, and fast forward to where we are today, I'm so happy and glad that we never used it for a wrestling character and not to, to uh, devalue any face painted wrestling characters because I, I, I've been inspired by a, a couple of them. Um, it just would have been another cheesy face painted wrestling character. So now I have an opportunity and which I've been doing and working on, uh, doing various things with, to take it to more of the, I guess, I don't know, comic book world, um, I, uh, cinema, you know, there's some different film projects and things that I'm gonna be working on. So um, it's got a bigger message than that too. And the, the character stands for, you know, it's fear, but the message is, you know, face your fear and own your life. Too many times we, including myself to this very day, I battle it every day, you know, is, is wrestling with fear. Uh, it could be fear of success, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of change in the world with this pandemic that's hit the world. A lot of change, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear is circulating in the world. And so this character is very near and dear to my heart. It's, it's really, it's essentially a theatrical expression of Sean, of me, you know? Uh, and it's become more and more real as I've gotten older because I, I can, uh, you know, when I connect with what the meaning is and, and you know, uh, it's more than just a face painted character. So um, the reason why I started talking about this is because Boise, Idaho, that's where it really all began for me with my pro wrestling career. I sent the tape yeah. out, got my tryout, and then who would have thought years later of all the cities and places you could go, I'd be back in Boise, Idaho, basically, Nampa, Idaho, it's a suburb, like 20 miles away, to be to win my very first title, in this case, WCW Tag Team Champion with Chuck Palumbo, defeating Chronic in Nampa, I come on, man. It was just like full circle, it was so crazy that it was full there. Full circle. So. Amazing. Boy, that's yeah, a long, that's, that's a, that's a, that, that's a long, that, that was a long story just to get to Boise, Idaho, isn't it? <laughs> it was good, man. It's all good. I love, I love a good full circle story. Anybody that watches uh, my interviews knows that I like a good full circle story. I like seeing how, um, true people's hard work and everything, how things seem to just kind of circle back around and you, you have these, uh, these special kind of, uh, um, kind of tied in moments with, with certain sentimental things like so that, that that's really cool though I, I like that yeah, but um, just, uh, just getting into um, behind the scenes in WCW uh, like Vince Russo was um, the head writer in uh, in 2000 how, how, how was your uh, relationship with Vince and did you get to work with uh, Bischoff much so I'm not sure timeline wise how long he would have been there when, when, when you were there but uh, how did you get along with Vince and if you had much interaction with uh, Eric Bischoff well, Bischoff's on my shit list right now, and I'll tell you why. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't, you know, the, every, everyone and their grandmother has a podcast, right? He's got a, a thing called 83 Weeks. It's pretty good. Actually, I've always liked Eric. I think Eric's actually, I think he's a, he's, I mean, the way he presents himself, he's a great speaker. I saw his TED Talk. I was very impressed with that. He's very articulate, yeah. very, uses elegant words. He's a very intelligent guy, you know? Uh, and, and I never, you know, I would cross, you know, paths with Eric backstage here and there. It was always just, how you doing? Shake your hand. I think I went, came to him for a couple, you know, get his insight on a couple things. Hey, could you watch my match? Let me know what you, you know, what you think of this promo, whatever. And that's where I'm going with this. Speaking of promos, apparently, um, well, you know, here's the thing. I, I, I look back at my work, you know, and I cringe most of the time. I'm like, God, I wish I had an opportunity to go back and redeem myself on that. That sucked, you know? And the thing I was doing with Stacy Keebler and the Bam Bam Bigelow 
angle. Yeah. You know, it was kind of cheesy with the hairspray. It was such vanity and stupid. I mean, if I ever, if, if I ever um, were to grace the ring or the wrestling world again, you can rest assured I would never, I, I'm not a poser. I'm not a narcissist, uh, although my friends will call me that because I play this narcissist character. I'm always posing at them and doing stupid things, you know, just for their 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 amusement. But um, uh, basically, you just get an extension, a real reflection of me, Sean, and that's just a guy. Um, I'd say I've always said this, you know, a, a guy that's full of piss and vinegar, world class athlete, um, looking to kick some ass and create history with his father. That was the longest camp, you know, long, for the longest time, the campaign that I was pushing for. Um, to, to make history in the WWE, becoming the first father-son duo to ever win that title. Um, hmm. But I realized that some of the, you know, some of my work, I cringe too, it's cheesy, but I guess Bischoff, I guess I'm a lousy talker on the mic. I guess I, uh, you know, and it just came across in a way that was very, um, I don't know, a little, a little bit arrogant, you know, and I was surprised, like, man, I thought we were, you know, there's there's different ways and choices of words you can use maybe to say, okay, I wasn't too crazy about this or that, but I was just like, okay, you're going to judge me and base me on one one promo, one night of promos, you know? Are we not not allowed to have an off night? You know, shit happens. So anyway, yeah. but as far as Eric, I never had a great, um, or uh, sorry, I never had uh, a deep relationship with him. And same with Vince, really. I mean, it was just... Uh, maybe a little bit more than Eric because, you know, he was writing the show at the time that I was there. And so we would go over certain things, but usually the agents is really what, you know, I would, we would work things out with the match and whatnot coming from Vince. And if there was any question or specifics, I would just go to Vince, but I always felt comfortable around Russo. Um, I did his podcast, of, you know, I think three or four years ago, we had an interview and um, I've never had a problem with him. He's very, him and Bischoff, they're very polarizing people, aren't they? <laughs> they seem to be uh, yeah same with, sure. same with same with Jim Cornette too I mean I think that's just the nature I think that's just the nature of the business you know I mean you just got these polarizing people but um yeah just to answer your question um you know always I always liked Eric I never got to know him real well but uh, didn't have a you know real didn't work together with him much at the time because I think that when they brought uh the new blood in you know and they had that, um, what was it, the, the veterans versus the, the new blood? Yeah, the uh, the millionaires uh, club, I think, was yeah, the, I think the, was, the veterans group, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the millionaires club. It was like dissension going on backstage, and I don't know. I think Eric left, and I, I don't even remember. It's so vague to me, but, you know, that's pretty much my, my relationship with those two guys. And uh, so uh, we fast forward on to the um, to the final nitro. Uh, what what are your memories of of that night? The the, the hostile takeover, so to speak, like of the WWE coming into the, uh, to camp, and uh, like you worked with Bam Bam that night, went uh, went over on it. But uh, what mm -hmm. what are your memories of kind of even the lead up to that? Like hearing this that Vince had uh, that had bought the company and uh, the the whole lead up to the whole buyout happening. Well, I had heard, uh, you know, the rumors about the company uh, is going to be bought out by WWE. And honestly, Jonathan, I personally, I felt that my work had progressed. I felt that since they gave me the opportunity to kind of be a solo, of course, they stuck me with Stacey Keebler. But, you know, I thought I was comfortable with her. I thought it was a compliment to the character and the, the cheesiness of the character at the time, you know. Um, and I, I just felt, I felt, and you know, I was in shape. I felt like I fine-tuned myself physically. I felt that my promos were, um, you know, improving. I mean, it, it's just like, it takes time with, just like with any craft, man, you've got to work at it for a while to get better and better. And I just think with repetition, um, I just felt that I was getting more comfortable and finding myself a little bit more as a singles wrestler. Um, mm. And and so I, I think that if that company would have stayed around, I mean, I, I had heard rumor um, that the next elevation for me was to between, and I don't know how true this really is, but this is what I had heard. I think it was from Johnny Laronitis at the time because he was an agent back then too. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure what his position is now with WBE. I know he's back there, but, um, you know, he said it's going to be between you, Booker T, and Jeff Jarrett, um, kind of like three of you kind of going battling for the U.S. title or something. It was a, It was an elevation, you know, and I was like, great, man, that's awesome, you know, because... 
I had great yeah. lunches with Booker T. I, know, I worked with Jeff one time. It was those guys were both smooth because they're such good veterans. And uh, but Booker, man, I had great. I just felt I had great chemistry with him. I really enjoy working with him. Um, I think I think he's a great talent, and he's a funny guy too. He's he's <laughs> I can never keep a straight face around him. But um, yeah, that was um, you know I felt confident, even though what had happened happened about a little over a year prior with that tape recorder incident. I just felt, I just had this faith, Jonathan. I just felt, hey man, you know, you've you've honed your craft better. You know, you've kind of had a proving grounds. Um, you were accepted by this company. I mean, I just didn't have, I didn't have, um, I wasn't overly worried or concerned that I wouldn't be accepted back. And I, I was, was one of the, the first 10 contracts to be bought back over. At the time, it wasn't the big contracts like, guys that were holding out like the stings and i think lugers and scott steiners and guys that had the bigger contract which made sense they had guaranteed money and i don't know the details but if they would have gone over they might have broken it and it was just made more sense for those guys on a financial business sense to stay away for a while you know rest up and maybe come over later so for me they just bought it right over and i was you know I have mixed emotions about that. And I mean, I was grateful at the time, but I don't, I, and I don't want to sound like I'm bitching and complaining, but I don't, I think it's pretty obvious that I don't think WB really had plans for me to really go to that next level. Um, the best they seemed to have for me was to rub shoulders with the rock and be the jackass clown running the milk trucks and walls, even though it was an honor to work with Dwayne and it was funny at the time. And, you know, it's about putting smiles on faces, but you know, I look back now, I, they fed me to guys like Brock Lesnar, you know, it was just these squash matches, more or less. So I think I was almost looked upon uh, as kind of like the cost of doing business. You have business expenses and write-offs. I felt that Sean Stasiak and his contract was a write-off because we're going to feed this guy to build other people. And I just seemed to never be able to get momentum going. I, the Planet Stasiak idea was cheesy and stupid. It was not, my idea was really based uh, more from the actor Jim Carrey in the Riddler and Batman, his ma mannerisms and demeanor and traits is supposed to be more like that. Um, it, it, it forced the reckon with, he might be a little out there and he's a little crazy, but he's very, he needs to be taken seriously. You know, very charismatic, very colorful, uh, right? I, I even had these visions of, of my entrance with this character and it would have ran into some animation and kids with the, that put these like, like Jeff Jarrett used to have this with those glasses that would blink, those little shades that would blink with lights. I had this vision and, you know, in the arena that the lights would go out when Planet Stasiak's making his flight in a spaceship from Planet Stasiak to wherever that city, that town was. And then it would be displayed on the screen and it's here, Dallas, Texas, and boom. And it's really cool theatrical. If, if they, if I could take my vision and have it transcended onto into, to them portraying it the way that I had it, it, it would have gotten over huge. It would have been a big revenue draw, a merchandise. Kids would have loved it. It was, it would be really cool, but it, we just never got on the same page. And I wasn't, I guess at that time, uh, just not at the, the point where I could really do much. I, my hands were tied, you know, because I just, wasn't able to get that, um, the right people, I guess, you know, and I, I want to say this without sounding, you know, that I'm complaining, but look, at the end of the day, man, you have to have somebody that has influence behind the scenes to go to bat for you and represent you. And I just never really had that person. I didn't have a Jim Ross or a Pat Patterson, um, guys like the rock, you know, had Pat for instance, and, and Dwayne's awesome, man. He worked his ass off and he, he deserves everything that he's gotten, even in Hollywood. I'm, I'm very happy for him, man. It's awesome what he's done. And I think he's a good human being too, you know, uh, a good person. Hmm. But you can only go so far in life. Um, you can have all the talent in the world. You can have all the potential. You can have, you know, that goes with musicians, actors, in this case, pro wrestlers. You got to have the right people. You know, the stars got to line up, man. You got to have the right things to make it all work, to really, really get over and work. And uh, unfortunately, I just didn't, just couldn't get on the same page with the right people, I guess, you know. I don't know where, where that came from. I don't know why I gave you all that, but <laughs> there you go, man. Well, that's a, 
that's all good, man. That that's all good. Um, we'll just get into uh, some uh, quick uh, fan questions uh, before we sign off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, John Showan wants to know um, about uh, uh, Kurt Angle's debut match. Uh, could you uh, in? Did you kind of envision how big of a star uh, Kurt would uh, go on to be from from that debut? Did you see the potential uh, for for you know big things for him? Yeah, well, I, I trained with Kurt. Um, I was part of those, uh, they're called the Funking Dojo Camps in Stanford, Connecticut in the old warehouse. Oh, yeah. And I was, yeah. I, I think I had the record for like 10 of them. I think uh, Andrew Martin, Test, I think he was second or maybe he tied me or something. But Kurt Angle was part of one of these groups that every month or every couple of weeks would have a bunch of guys. They'd fly in for tryouts and if they liked you but you weren't quite ready, they'd invite you back. I lived there. They just took me in and my developmental deal was right there in Stanford. So I basically was right there with Tom Pritchard every day. And um, But yeah, Kurt came in and I was an amateur wrestler, of course, and I looked up to Kurt for what he had done by winning the world championships and becoming the Olympic gold medalist, right, in 96. So I was like a mark for amateur wrestling. I was like, man, anything he needs, man, to train, I'm there, you know. So we ended up traveling together, Kurt and I. Um, we were on the road for a while. He was doing dark matches while I broke in as meat, you know, in my rookie year. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, he picked up really fast. And um, I remember we had some great matches, actually, some dark matches that no one will have ever seen because right? it was never recorded unless someone recorded mm -hmm. it somewhere. But uh, we just had great chemistry because I really respected him. And I think there was a mutual respect because of my background. Um, I didn't know how big... I guess I didn't think about it back then. I, I knew that he was green, and I but I knew he was a great athlete, an Olympic gold medalist, uh, hmm. and trained real hard, very committed. And I just thought, man, if he's got that kind of commitment and, you know, to be able to win an Olympic gold medal and he really puts his heart and mind into this, I mean, why wouldn't he excel in this, you know? So I, I don't know. Looking back now, I don't I – don't, and this is no disrespect to Kurt at the time, but I don't know if I would have seen him as big as he got. And now we know he's one of the best. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Jack Reynolds wants to know, um, what match do, uh, would you say was um, where you had your best uh, individual performance, let's say? Maybe not mm -hmm. so much your favorite match, but where you would th think like, this was me at my very best or my career. You know, it's funny, but the two matches that stick out in my mind as a singles competitor was that the question yeah either way whether okay. it be a tag or a singles yeah one, whichever i mean I, I think the one that really stands out to me is i had two matches with chris jericho in new york albany new york and somewhere else two shots in new york and they were they were um they were house shows and i just remember everything i had never experienced professional wrestling like I did that night and I'll tell you why here are all the elements when I walked out to the ring I had more roaring deep boos than I had ever heard and I was like this is awesome because I was a heel right but I yeah. but it was a real they were emotionally invested for some reason they was I was not like that night which is great for me that's a pop for me Chris comes out place erupts so the polarity of the booze and then the, the cheers was like, this is great. Everything he did, they popped. Everything I did, they booed. It was the, it was the crowd reaction, the, the connection with the crowd that I had never felt before. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's because you know, he was a you know, veteran at the time, even back, that was 20 years ago. I mean, he was more experienced than I was. And he was over as Chris Jericho, right? Back then. Mm -hmm. I felt that it brought out the best in me and it did and so I just felt man I was just on everything was on you know just my transitions my punches kicks psychology was there and I was listening he was leading um but everything I did it was so easy Jonathan it was like oh my god this is what they talk about you know when you have it down hmm. like that it was great and then the time he put me in the walls of Jericho that place was erupted and and so anyway it was um it got back i mean i mean when you know when the undertaker and mark calloway or, or uh stephen regal 
walk up to you after and, and, and shake your hand and say, hey, man, I watched you tonight, and you, you had a really pleasant match tonight. You, you did really good. That's like the biggest compliment you can get, especially wow. from those guys, you know? So yeah. um, that, that's what really stands out to me. I wish they were on – I wish they were recorded some. I wish that they we could watch them back because I'd be very interested to see what that looked like. I knew what it felt like, and I knew the reaction it got, not from the just the crowd, but – the boys, the agents, and then Vince heard about it. And guess what? I ended up getting a raise the next week. <laughs> so I must have done something right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. Uh, Paul Fraser wants to know, um, what did the uh, mecca on your uh, tights stand for? <laughs> you know, or what was the meaning behind it? It's funny, man. I, don't, I, I think Terry Taylor came up with that. Uh, you're the mecca of manhood. like Because I had this va vain character, almost like Rick Rude. A cross between Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, and I don't know who else. Anyway, just a very arrogant, you know, maybe Lex Luger, which I could see on your wall there when he's the... Oh, yeah, yeah. we got him over here, yes. <laughs> so I think he just came up with that, you know what, you need to get something on the back of your tights and something that represents your your arrogance. How about the mecca of manhood? You know, something... It's funny, in pro wrestling, the, the, the stupidest things out of the blue just happen, they say by accident, and then it's like, oh, that's a good catchphrase. Yeah, that's a good that's a good word all you you know that's how it happened you know so i just got mecca put on the back of my trunks i think and even in one of my um pre-taste backstage i was working with, with uh, steve austin stone cold and deborah at the time his wife and i'm like i think in one of my at the time i don't think i even knew what it meant i was like i don't even know what mecca means <laughs> but it was on my <laughs> yeah, trunk. yeah 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 i remember <laughs> Uh, let's go now. Let's go. So, uh, just before we go, um, uh, you kind of alluded to it earlier on. Uh, uh, give us uh, your thoughts on everything that's happening in the wrestling world uh, at the at the moment currently, like with AEW and everything. Like things are are uh, pretty hot at the moment with Punk's return and everything. What do you think about everything yeah. that's going on WWE AEW at the moment? <clears throat> so, I'm gonna watch what I say here because I might ruffle some feathers. But then at the same time, I can't. I'm just being authentic and real. I don't. I don't watch. I do a lot of DVRing, put it that way. So I fast oh, yeah, forward through a lot of stuff. I think yeah, we, a lot of us do. DVR. And I just, you know, I come from a um, a background where, look, not all people can look the same body types or bodybuilder type. I was more of a body guy. I was just, you know, let's face it, I was inspired by the better physiques. And at the time that was, you know, and that was kind of a prototype for Vince McMahon. He liked those types of looks, right, and, and bodies and whatnot. Absolutely. Um, the business has changed a lot since my time, even even 20 years, you know, um, I'm never going to be one of those guys that says, well, back in my day, kid, you know, my, 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 my era is, uh, was this, that, and the others and yours is the shits. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that guy, but there's elements of the business that I think have been lost. It's an art, some, some elements of the art has been lost. And, you know, then again, the fans today embrace this certain styles of today's wrestling. I just personally don't agree with it and, and I can't get completely into it, but I, I accept it for what it is, you know? Um, hmm. So, and, and it's not being disrespect. I don't mean to sound disrespectful to anybody, but I just come from a certain cloth and I just, I'm proud of it, man. And I'll, and it's just, you know, I know that if I, let's say hypothetically was back in the wrestling realm, I know what how i'm going to portray myself and how what, how i'm going to represent myself and i have a lot of pride in that man you know just uh yeah. just from growing up around the business my dad's era my era and even being away for as long as i have you know you learn about yourself as a man you learn yourself about uh, learn about yourself you know in the world learn about the world um you know i'm not the same guy as i was 20 years ago and i've often thought you know, it'd be really interesting to showcase this inner character that I didn't realize it existed all this time that I could exude on camera. I can tell you right now, I think it would be great for ratings because it would piss a lot of people off. And I think a lot of people, though, of my era and generation uh, fan base that we lost might come back. Anyway, I love comebacks. I love redemption stories. When CM Punk made his uh, return... And I was never a huge CM Punk fan, I'll be quite honest with you. But I did follow him a little bit when he went after his UFC 
dream, which I give him mm. all the credit in the world. He had balls to do it. He went out yeah, there, definitely. he fought. You know, I really gained a lot of respect. I gained for that, that guy. He took a lot of criticism and all that. It's like, screw those people. They don't, you try it then, you know? Like, yeah, exactly. Same with Brock trying out for football, you know, the NFL. I mean, you know, you got to you got to try different things, man, you know, and I have more respect for people, you know, win, lose or draw. As long as you went out there and gave you your all, that's all you can. You know, that to me is a winner. That's a champion, man, deep down. Um, but when he came back, man, and of course, I was in New York City for an autograph signing at the time. And the only thing I could watch it off is my phone on YouTube. Man, I must have rewound it and watched that entrance the, the the whole thing actually the full i think it was 18 minutes from the end i just had go like i got goosebumps right now thinking about it man it was freaking awesome yeah. it was awesome and it's and it's times like those it's 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 experiences like that those why we all get into this business to create those memories to cre create those very far and few between those rarities that he had that connection with the crowd. Now, of course, it's in Chicago, the anticipation. It was all the stars were aligned. It was a perfect way to bring him in. But I love what moved me, and I've talked to a few people about it, it was just the authenticity, the realness, the organicness, the connection with the crowd. I mean, I you know, people were crying. It was just a really amazing experience. And I don't want to over-dramatize this, but that's what you know that term art imitates life you know and that was one of those moments where art which is pro wrestling taking parallels of a shoot reality parallels and incorporating those into a work environment that's professional wrestling man and that's what i yeah. think uh that's what i'm drawn to that's why i'm fast forwarding my dvr very so often very very rare i'll come across a certain promo, a back and forth in the ring, even a, a it's like the, the actual wrestling match is almost like window dressing. It's almost like who gives a shit about how many flips and moves and whatever you do if people aren't emotionally invested. That's the whole point of pro wrestling is to get people emotionally invested. And so I loved it. I thought it was great. And I, I'm, I think Punk was also probably humble just in life and going through his trials and tribulations and what you know when he, going through what he went through with wwe his experience and then the ufc and then now this i think it's great man um i'm happy for him and i'm a i'm a punk fan now i'm pulling for him i i just hope we can keep the momentum it's only going to last so long like he even and that's what i love about punk he's very honest he's very authentic and real and i love real jonathan yeah and that's why you know i'm developing myself as a speaker a wellness life coach because i love nothing more than connecting with people like you and i right now and just having I, I love real. I love, and also showcasing and sharing more so your failures, your hardships, your, your shortcomings. I've had so many of them. It's one, you know, who gives a crap about someone who glow like, oh, so-and-so is successful they, and they have all these titles and labels. And, you know, people will come to me and say, oh man, you know, you've had success. You were, you know, in the wrestling world, people know who you are. You're a doctor, you're, you know, you, you're, you stayed in shape and you got all, they think that, you know, uh, I've got the world by the balls, right? And I'm very grateful for some of the attributes and things and, and what, I've worked for everything I have, but man, have I ever had failures and I still wrestle. The biggest opponent that I wrestle with is the one you see in your monitor right now. I wrestle with him every day, okay? And um, what I've learned is, uh, and that's gonna be part of this YouTube channel, part of my speaking uh, events that I'm gonna be putting on soon, some virtual stuff, so just stay tuned for that. Um, I love sharing and probably it's probably therapeutic for me, you know, to get it out and filter it in a way that I can deliver it, but people can resonate with it and apply it They hear a story and an example. Maybe I'll make a couple suggestions like don't do what I did here. You know, don't try this or what. And I get feedback like, man, I tried this or I heard your story or what. And it really, truly changed my life. Boy, man, that is again, goosebump moments. I just, I love creating goosebumps and inspiration and being real and knowing that I made a contribution to someone's life, whether I played a role in a wrestling ring, whether the phobia character did something uh, cinematic or on a video project or whatever, a social media post, or just holding the door for someone at the grocery store. I, I just love to be real with people and know that something that I contributed in a way uh, really made a difference in their lives. So. I know that's a little bit down a rabbit hole, but you know, getting back to today's wrestling, I love the, the authenticity and the realness of, of the punk thing. 
Um, I'm excited for AEW. I think uh, I've been backstage a couple times and um, met Tony Khan once. Seems like a really nice guy, you know, um, very, very respectful. Um, everybody seemed to be, for the most part, really cool. And I think it's great for the wrestling business. I hope that they have all the success in the world. Competition creates, uh, you know, success. And, and it's a great opportunity for the boys, for the talent, for the girls. I got to say girls, too. The boys and girls, right? And uh, mm -hmm. it's great for our uh, the fans, man. How excited are you as a wrestling fan because of this? I like it. I mean, like, I'm kind of in the same in a similar mindset uh, as yourself there are some things in both companies in the wrestling business in general now that uh, it's got it's in terms of the in-ring style anyway the um the lack of realism at times bothers me it just goes mm -hmm. too it just goes too a little too far out there in terms of spots and j yeah. just not making quite the effort of you know getting me as a fan to suspend my disbelief like but there are still some really really great talents that that they are like so like there is still enough moments to kind of keep me hooked in but like yourself now i do dvr yeah <laughs> but uh overall it's i mean it's brilliant to have co uh, competition uh again and just th that uh, dynamic of um like where wrestlers are going to go again like this, uh, like Punk jumping to AEW has really ignited that. Daniel Bryan now as well. So like, there's that dynamic again, like it was back in the Monday Night Wars, uh, as they say. You know, with um, guys jumping back and forth, and you never knew where uh, some guys were going to end up. Like, you know, right. so it's made it really interesting in in those terms. So it's it's a it's a brilliant time to be a fan. But thank God for DVR at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the one thing about today's wrestling that I don't like is all these spots and moves. And it's like, come on, man, like you've done 20 finishes. Now the guy keeps kicking out, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, what happened to a Rick rude neck breaker? Just one boom. That's it. It's done. One punch. My dad's yeah. heart punch. Wham done. Yes. You know, like, uh, you know, now look, I'm being maybe a little too simplistic, but you got to have, you know, finishes and, and false finishes and excitement. And there's a way of doing it, but man, it's a little overboard, I think, with the with the finishes, especially. I agree with you. And it's not, I always say it's not Circus LA. It's not gymnastics class. This is professional wrestling. And there's got to be a fine balance, I think, an element of power, strength, strongman, size differences, um, you know, just when you do things, uh, how you, body language, like just there's, you know, your cadence and when you're speaking and how you pronounce words and when you deliver. I mean, there's so many elements to pro wrestling that, and, and not everyone can be the same, just like body types. You can't have all bodybuilders. That'd be boring if you had all yeah. fat guys or you had all giants or all midgets. You got to have a, a mixture of all the diversity, right? But I think within each context of that, diversity you need to stay within a parameter lane right to to keep things exactly. realistic even though we know it's a work if i go to a movie and i'm suspending my disbelief i still i get pissed off i was like okay come on dude this guy should be dead by now you know this guy just keeps yeah. coming back you know you got to have some elements of of reality and when you and when you watch a movie or you see a match like that it's like oh well done it just seems like it's been far and few between lately but it is what it is. Yeah, there's still there's still moments here and there. There's still matches here and there. But yeah, it is. A little, uh, I actually think WCW almost had the perfect balance in the, the late night in nineties two thousand two thousands because you had like the high flying stuff and and all that kind of thing, you know. But it, within the cruiserweight division, but it was kind of kept in that in that niche, and that was very popular. But it didn't seep all the way through the card you had like power guys you had you had a lot of different dynamics mm -hmm. in terms of styles and everything so like i i think that's what's needed just that bit more a uh, bit more variety and uh, just a little bit more grounded in realism and a bit more grounded in kind of uh good and evil uh type dynamics then as well rather than everything kind of shades of gray and like you know so but again there there, there is there is a, a, a lot of good stuff out there at the same time, like so. I don't want to beat on it too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and I'm this, in the same boat too. I think there's certain wrestlers I don't. 
it doesn't, you know, there's an optical element where you, I understand if someone's got great moves and they're very technical, but there's size differences. And I'm sorry, but I, I have a hard time accepting some of these world heavyweight champions. I, I just do, you know? Um, that's why I thought in WCW as well, when you mentioned that, I think WWE had this years ago, you have a cruiserweight division that's just as prestigious. It's like saying Floyd, yes. Floyd Mayweather is the champion in his, his weight class, whatever that is, 150 pounds. And you got, you know, Mike Tyson and, you know, the heavyweights in this division. The, now, the, yeah. heavy, the heavyweight division is probably the big, if you're the world champion as a heavyweight, really in anything, you're kind of the man, I guess. But mm -hmm. it doesn't take away from a cruiserweight or a middleweights that are, look at George St. Pierre. Look at... Um, God, who are so like? I mean, some of these Conor McGregor, US, Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather, even like you right, mentioned. right. They're 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 smaller guys, but it's very prestigious, you know. So why? Yeah, it's just too much blurring the lines for me too, you know. And I think you need to keep people in their lanes, and there's enough people in each lane to work with and and create magic, you know. You don't have to. I think Rey Mysterio, I think, was the first real small guy. I think did he not go over on Kevin Nash or something? I forget what. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're in like 99. Yeah, he went over on Nash. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you have something like that happen once in a blue moon, that's that's fine. That's cool. You know, uh, one, two, three kid went over on uh, uh, Scott Hall or, you know, Scott stuff like Hall, that. Yeah. There's been a couple, yeah. but it just is, I think it's gotten a little bit um, just unrealistic, you know? Yeah, definitely. So hopefully, yeah, it gets uh, more grounded and all that good stuff. Um, I, I want to thank you so much for for uh, for your time today, man. It's been absolutely awesome talking to you. You always know it's a good interview, and the time absolutely flies by, and oh, okay, uh, the great. time has flown fl fl flown by on this, man. It's been absolutely awesome. Uh, finally, getting My pleasure. To to connect with you and uh, yeah it's been it's been brilliant man thanks so much for your time yeah no absolutely uh, Jonathan I really enjoyed this as well and I, I do want to say this not just saying this because you're you know in Ireland but I've always um, I love the UK man I've got I did that one of those DNA tests you know those I think it was um, God what are they called I did one a couple years ago anyway it came back uh, that I was 53% Russian and Baltic countries however I had 22, 23% like Norwegian, Swedish, and then like 20% was the rest was like Scotland, uh, Ireland, Wales. So I've got that UK blood in me. And I've always loved going back. Um, I've always felt drawn, you know, to the UK. So I'd love to come back to visit, you know, I, I hope I get that opportunity soon. Um, and we'll definitely have to have uh, a couple ales or whatever you drink over there in Ireland. What do you call them? Whiskies? <laughs> uh, pints. <laughs> pints. There you go. Pints. Couple yeah. of pints. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure, man. Yeah, I love, sure. I love my UK fans. So I want to give a shout out to them. They always seem very uh, loyal and, and uh, supportive. And um, yeah, just uh, follow, follow me on my social media. It's uh, on Twitter and um, Instagram is Dr. Sean, D-R-S-H-A-W-N-008. Um, and of course, Facebook is Sean Stasiak hyphen Stippich. I use Stasiak as the first name uh, because it's more recognizable. But Stippich is my real last name for people that, uh, you know, you got long lost relatives and people that knew you from high school that may not know Stasiak. They know Stippich though, right? So that's why I have it like that. Most married women have the double name thing. Why, why do you have two names with two last? Pick one, Stasiak or Stippich. Well, that's why I did that. So, so people can find me. And then the YouTube channel is uh, Sean Stasiak's world. So check it out. Awesome, man. Can't wait to see everything that you uh, have coming up. And uh, yeah, thanks again, man. It's been awesome. Yes, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. God bless, brother. Take care. Take care, my man. Bye-bye.